Madam President, with me today is Mr. Seth Brazier, who is one of my colleagues in, the, in my Senate office. Mr. Pre Madam President, I want to talk about uh, my city today, the, uh, the city of New Orleans. Uh, the city of New Orleans is iconic, and the whole world knows it. My first job in state government was with a reform governor back in the late 1980s named Governor Buddy Romer. J Japan was uh, doing extraordinarily well at that time economically, making many foreign investments, and Governor Romer traveled to, to Japan to try to convince Japan to invest in Louisiana. And when the governor got back, he told me, he said, Kennedy, my first meeting was, was very enlightening. He said, my first meeting I, be, I met with about uh, 50 Japanese business people. He said, I asked them, how many of you have been to Louisiana? The governor said, three of them raised their hand. He said, then I asked him another question. He said, I asked these 50 Japanese business people, how many of you have been to New Orleans? He said, 25 of them raised their hand. The city of New Orleans is iconic. Every state, every country would love to have a New Orleans. Our city was founded over 300 years ago. We're one of the oldest in America. It was founded in 1718. Our city is envied for, let's see, our food, our music, our architecture, our diversity, our dialects, our merriment, and our festivals for our celebration of life. In New Orleans, we dance with or without music. But New Orleans, Madam President, is under attack. People there are being murdered. They are being shot. They are being raped. They are being stabbed. Their stuff is being stolen and our quality of life is being degraded because of crime. Because of crime, cancer, a cancer on our city. In 2002, I want to give you a, 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 a sense of the breadth of our problem. In 2022, we had 280 murders in New Orleans. The victims range from six months of age to 91 years old. 10% of these victims were under the age of 18. 70% were people of color. Listen to this. One out of every eight black males who live in New Orleans between the age of 15 to 24 will be shot. One out of eight. Statistically, it is more dangerous to be young and black in New Orleans than it was to be a Marine in the Battle of Fallujah during the height of the insurgency in Iraq. Those are the numbers. Last year, my city had the highest murder rate in the country, twice the murder rate of Atlanta, twice. We had the most murders since 1996. Our murder rate was up 141% since 2019. And it's not just murder, Madam President. Shootings in 2022 were up 88% from 2019. Carjackings up 156%. Armed robberies up 20%. And it's not much better in 2023. Now, 
behind these sterile statistics are real, live human beings. Flesh and bones. Blood and tissue. In one of the most appalling cases that we've had, about a year ago, in an area in New Orleans that we call Mid-City, four teenagers, a 17-year-old boy, a 16-year-old girl, and two 15-year-old girls, four teenagers, carjacked a 73-year-old grandmother. The teenagers pulled the grandmother out of the car and drove away. But the grandmother's arm got tangled in the driver's seatbelt. The teenagers kept going. They dragged her for a block until her, her arm was severed. This lady bled to death at the scene. Crime in New Orleans is affecting all of us in our city. Residents, visitors, every income level, every part of our city. But no one is hit harder than our low-income communities. That's true both in terms of public safety and it's also true economically. Most poor people are not criminals. They're not. But criminals often prey on our lower income fellow citizens, particularly in their own communities. Existing businesses then leave and they take jobs with them. And unemployment goes up and we have more poverty. And those businesses that remain in our lower income, in lower income communities, they're often mom and pop shops with a small margin of profit. They have to pay more for insurance, they have to pay more for security, they have to pay more for credit, so they have to raise their prices. And that makes people even poorer. That's what crime does. We have tried, we in New Orleans, Madam President, we have tried everything. We have around 900 police officers. We need 2,000. Because many of our police officers retire every day. We've tried paying higher salaries. We've tried paying better benefits. We've tried curfews. We've tried task forces. We've tried social programs. We've tried after school programs. We've tried crime cameras. We've tried facial recognition. We've tried conflict management. We've tried mentoring. We've tried youth clubs. We've tried job training. We've tried enhanced educational opportunities. We've tried prosecuting juveniles as adults. We've tried hotspot policing. We've tried 12-hour shifts. We've tried hiring administrative personnel to take the paper uh, workload off of our, our cops to get them back on the street. You name it, Madam President, and we have tried it. We've tried everything but one thing. Stop and frisk. Stop and frisk. Under the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution, a police officer may stop a suspect on the street without probable cause. And that police officer can stop that person on the street without probable cause so long as that police officer has what's called reasonable suspicion to believe that the person stopped has committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime. And after that person is stopped, if the police officer has reasonable suspicion to believe that the person stopped might be carrying a weapon, the police officer can pat down that person on the outside of his or her clothing. That's called stop and frisk. 
It's a very effective law enforcement practice. It is used by police officers every day in virtually every city all across America, and it has been used since 1968. In 1968, the United States Supreme Court decided a case, a very famous case, called Terry v. Ohio. Terry v. Ohio. The, uh, the very liberal Chief Justice, I don't use the word liberal in a pejorative sense, I'm just describing him as, as many scholarly works have. The very liberal Chief Justice Earl Warren actually wrote the opinion in Terry v. Ohio, and he was joined in that opinion by Justices Hugo Black, Justice John Harlan, Justice William Brenner, Brennan, Justice Potter Stewart, Justice Byron White, Justice Abe Ford, Fortas, and Justice Thurgood Marshall. They all said together, here's our opinion, Terry v. Ohio. And what did that opinion say? That opinion said that under appropriate circumstances, stop and frisk is permissible. It is perfectly constitutional under the Fourth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now, I want you to note that a police officer cannot stop and frisk somebody on a whim, uh, 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 on a hunch. A cop does not have unfettered discretion. In order for a police officer to, to stop a person on the street, that police officer, let me say it again, must have reasonable suspicion, reasonable suspicion to believe that the person has committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime. And once again, once the person is stopped, the cop can frisk that person on the outside of his clothing, called a pat-down, only if the cop has reasonable suspicion to believe that the person stopped is carrying a weapon. Why does the cop have this authority? To protect the cop d during, during the question. Reasonable suspicion is not a hunch. It's not a whim. It's an objective standard. It's not probable cause. You have to have probable cause to make an arrest, to conduct a search, for example, of someone's home. Probable cause is a higher standard. But reasonable suspicion is an objective standard. Reasonable suspicion exists according to the case law, as you know, Madam President. Reasonable suspicion exists when an objectively reasonable police officer, given the facts and circumstances of that particular situation, and considering the cop's training and experience, would suspect that a person, as I have said, has committed, is committing, or, or is about to commit a crime. And if, 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 uh, if probable cause is then established, of course, the person can be arrested. Every cop in America who goes through training academy, and every cop in America does, every cop in America knows about stop and frisk. Every cop in America is trained in the law enforcement practice of stop and frisk. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose a police officer is driving by, and he sees an individual late at night, walking along the street with a coat hanger or a Slim Jim. Do you all know what a Slim Jim is? It's sometimes called a lockout tool. It's a way to get into a car if you lost your keys. If a police officer sees someone late at night walking down the street with a coat hanger or a Slim Jim looking in cars, the police officer can stop that first person. Can he arrest that person? No. He does not, does not have probable cause. No crime has been committed. But he has reasonable suspicion to stop and talk to that person. 
And once he stops to talk to that person, if he sees a big bulge here in his top pocket, he, he may have reasonable suspicion to believe that person has a weapon, and it would be dangerous for him, to, him, the police officer, to keep talking to that person. So the police officer, he can't make him, him take his jacket off or anything. He can just pat him down to see if there's a weapon. Now, I repeat, cops all over America stop and frisk suspects every single day, and they have for 50 years. And you know who endorses it? the United States Supreme Court. Now, like all police practices, it can be abused. Stop and frisk can be abused. And when it is, it can be, and it should be challenged in court. And the abusing officer should be held accountable. But most officers don't abuse it. As many people know, mayors Rudy Giuliani and Michael Bloomberg, two New York mayors back to back, used stop and frisk extensively during the crime wave of the 1990s and the early part of this century to fight crime and gun violence in New York City. We've all read about that. Crime fell dramatically. Now, some said, have said that's due in part to stop and frisk. Some have said that stop and frisk had nothing to do with it. Some have said that in some cases, the New York Police Department abused stop and frisk. And these who maintain that position said that too often, Police officers were stopping and frisking people on the basis not of reasonable suspicion, but on the basis of race or national origin. And that is wrong. A case was filed called Floyd v. City of New York. Floyd v. City of New York. It was a class action. Uh, it was filed against New York Mayor Bloomberg and others alleging that the NYPD was not stopping people on the basis of reasonable suspicion, but on the basis of race and national origin. The federal district court in that case ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. The NYPD then set about the business of reforming its stop and frisk policy, but uh, Mayor Bloomberg left office, Mayor Bill de Blasio became mayor, and for all practical purposes, he completely stopped the practice of uh, stop and frisk. So stop and frisk can be abused. And it is important to establish practices and procedures to guard against that abuse. But let me put this, this another way. This is how I look at it. Some cops may and have violated the legal requirements for a proper Terry v. Ohio stop and frisk. And when that happens, that may make that person a racist. Or at least guilty of committing a racist act. But that does not mean that the practice of stop and frisk is inherently racist. Because some knuckleheads abuse it does not mean that the practice is inherently racist. In fact... The United States Supreme Court, with only one dissent, has said that properly applied, it does not violate the Constitution of the United States and can be an effective law enforcement tool. So when there's an abuse, the abuse is on the cop. It's on the officer. And most officers don't abuse stop and frisk. And if it's proven that he did something wrong, he should be held accountable. The time has come, Madam President, the time has come for my city of New Orleans to try stop and frisk. It's time. Now, some of our public officials in New Orleans are going to probably disagree with me. And some are going to say, well, we're using stop and frisk already, Kennedy. They are every now and then. 
sometimes. But you go talk to the average cop on the street in New Orleans, I have. I've talked to many of them. They're going to tell you. The people with the flags in their offices, the politicians and the big shots in the, in the political hierarchy, they, don't, they, they are discouraging us using stop and frisk. They don't want us to use stop and frisk. I think it is time to allow. We've tried everything else, Lord knows. It is time to allow the men and women of the New Orleans Police Department to use stop and frisk without fear of losing their jobs. I do not believe that the New Orleans Police Department is racist. Let me say it again. I do not believe that the New Orleans Police Department is racist, systemically or otherwise. I do not believe that the average New Orleans Police Department police officer is racist. My God, the NOPD is 58% black and people of color and 35% white. Now, we have a federal consent decree in New Orleans for our police department. It's between the U.S. Department of Justice and the city of New Orleans. It oversees the, the uh, New Orleans Police Department, as we call it in NOPD. It was signed and entered into by Mayor Mitch Landrieu in 2010. The consent decree does not prohibit stop and frisk. In fact, the consent decree provides for stop and frisk. I want to quote, Mr. President, from the consent decree. Quote from the dissent decree. NOPD officers may only conduct investigatory stops or detentions where the officer has reasonable suspicion that a person has been, is, or is about to be engaged in the commission of a crime. End quote. Does that sound familiar? That's right out of Terry v. Ohio where the U.S. Supreme Court almost unanimously said stop and frisk when used appropriately is a very effective law enforcement tool. Now, the consent decree goes on wisely in my opinion. It mandates a stop and search data collection and review procedure. So the consent decree says if you're going to use stop and frisk, you've got to collect all the data. I think that's a great idea. The consent decree also requires the police officer, when he or she uses stop and frisk, to document the stop and frisk and detail the reasonable suspicion in writing. In writing. In New York, they call this a report UF-250 a UF-250 form. I don't know what it's called in New Orleans. They've been using stop and frisk on frequently. I'm not sure they have one. But it requires the, the cop who does the stop and frisk to sit down and say, here's the suspect. I had reasonable suspicion. And here, with specificity, is why. And let me say, collecting the data and requiring the reporting after the fact it's standard operating procedure. This is nothing new. It's standard operating procedure in every police department in America. It's also common sense. There is a gentleman in New Orleans by the name of Mr. Ronald Serpice. Mr. Serpice is a former superintendent. We call our chief of police at the NOPD the superintendent. He is a former NOPD superintendent. Mr. Serpice is also uh, a former chief of the Washington State Patrol. And he's now a professor of, of uh, I think, criminology at Loyola University in New Orleans. I don't speak for the superintendent, and I don't want to pretend to. Um, but, but he's written a number of articles in support of stop and frisk in New Orleans. He has said that the NOPD today has been reduced to only responding and reacting after a crime has been committed, when the damage has been done. 
The superintendent, the former superintendent, says what we need in New Orleans is more proactive policing to prevent crime, like stop and frisk. Now, the former superintendent has, ad, has uh, analyzed the publicly available data on the NOPD consent decree. We collect data on our consent decree. It's publicly available. In fact, uh, the city council has put up a dashboard for the consent decree. And one of the uh, provisions in the dashboard has a stop and search feature. You can go on the stop and search feature on the internet and see how many stops and frisks the police department has done in the past 180 days. So you have a date, and it looks back 180 days. This is what the former superintendent found after he analyzed the stop and search feature on the website. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if I was clear about the 180 days. For example, January 2, 2015, on that day, if you went back 180 days, the NOPD had conducted 32,913 stops in the prior 180 days. Let me say that again. January 2015, eight years ago, in 180 days prior, the NOPD had conducted 33,000 stops. As of January 18, 2023, eight years later, really seven because it's January, NOPD had conducted 5,095. Let's call it 5,000 stops over the past 180 days. 5,000 down from 33,000. And that 5,000 is spread over six months. Do you see a trend here? Now, during COVID, Mr. President, as you would expect, stops and frisks in New Orleans were down. I mean, people were inside. Following COVID, the stops increased, according to the superintendent who analyzed the data, increased to 14,303 in the 180 days before August 17, 2021. So think back to August 2021, over the prior, prior six months, NOPD did 17,000, I'm sorry, did, uh, yes, 17,000. Um, no, I'm sorry, 14,303 stops. But after that date, there was an uninterrupted decline in the number of stops down to 5,095 today. So the stops were up here. They came down. They went down further because of COVID. They went up to 14,000 in, in 20, August of 2021. Then they kept going down. That doesn't exactly, but it closely tracks the crime rate in New Orleans because stop and frisk is used to proactively prevent crimes. Look, Mr. President, I, I want you to understand the, 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 the problem in New Orleans. I love my city. I love my state. But I love my city, too. The problem in New Orleans is, and I don't want you to think that we have thousands of previously law-abiding New Orleans, New Orleanians turning to crime. That's not what is going on. We don't have a, a bunch of law-abiding people who've now turned to crime in my city. That's not, that's not what's happening. The problem we have is with career criminals, and they're running rampant. And our cops are spread thin. And we have some public officials, not all of them, but there's some that think cops are a bigger problem than criminals. And they think that you, you, criminals really shouldn't be prosecuted. They're not bad. They're just sick. This is America. You can believe what you want. 
But that's what's going on in my city. It's not a majority, but it's more than a handful. We need, we tried everything. We need to allow our police officers to stop and frisk. We need to allow our police officers to stop and frisk. It should be carefully monitored. It should be done legally, but it should be done. We have tried everything else, everything under the sun, to stop the extreme recidivists. Nothing has worked. And maybe this perfectly legal, very effective police practice, stop and frisk, which is used every day across America, will help.